Saan po na? Ninja ni na. Kuya Nan, damas and hair. Molweni. Good evening. Uh, I just want to reflect a bit on, uh, on where Professor Botman started. What is your vantage point from which you commit to engage society in a great transformational experiment? Well, in some circles, very influential circles, I'm put in the same category as some Peter Blanche, as a free agent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't deny that. I don't like the word agent. And I, I prefer to be called a free citizen. That's what I spent my whole life fighting for. And, uh, and I've said to my learned friends in my political movement, the ANC, that I owe my loyalty to God, which includes my teenage children. I owe it to the Constitution of South Africa. And I owe it to my own conscience. And if you don't really like that, well, there's two choices you have, because we're surrounded by two oceans, Atlantic and Indian. You can go and jump in either one of them. <laughs> because essentially, our struggle against apartheid was a struggle for voice. And I remember as the founding general secretary of COSATU that our guiding philosophy that some of the leaders of COSATU have forgotten today was that I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to death your right to say it. And I think that's what the struggle for freedom was. It was around the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, the freedom to participate within the rule of law, and that we embedded into our constitution as a constitutional democracy, at the heart of which sits the achievement of justice and of human dignity. And so I was very encouraged by what I saw in the interviews that you did of, teenage, of children that are now going to be born free, that are going to vote for the first time. You know, I have two teenage children that are going to vote for the first time. And uh, the things they say to me, I often say to them, no one else in the world talks to me like you do. <laughs> and, Bottom line is that, I re we re Dad, we respect your contribution that you made, the enormous contribution to winning freedom and restoring human dignity, which had been stolen. But actually today, we thank you for that. But we are going to vote for leaders who are honest, leaders who are accountable, leaders who are transparent, and leaders who deliver. And that gives me hope for the future of our democracy. So I think that's my vantage point. You know, I met Van Zale Slabert in the late 80s. I was the militant general secretary of probably the most militant trade union movement in the world. He was a businessman, a former member of parliament. I don't think anyone on either of our teams expected a Sunday school conversation. But Although we came from different sides of the political spectrum, I found him to be a person of intelligence and of integrity. He had rejected the notion of a white parliament as being relevant to solving the dilemma of, Af of, of South Africa. He had crossed that Rubicon and joined hands with the majority because he was a builder of the future. He had a vision very similar to the opening lines of the Freedom Charter, that South Africa belongs to all who live in it black and white. And I think today, Jane, we celebrate those extraordinary leaders that we had on all sides of the conflict that rose above the divisions in our society, that made a choice, a conscious choice, to step back from the precipice of a racial conflagration. And these are the people, the thousands of people, men and women of integrity, black and white, rich and poor, who made the democracy what we have today. And I think today, I am very honored to be here and to celebrate 
the vision that Franzel Slabert had. Because as the head of IDASA, he created an extraordinary dialogue, unprecedented between two warring sides, when he created the conditions under which we could take a senior group of Africana, academia, businessmen, and to meet the ANC, which had been branded a terrorist organization. And that was the first public inter 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 interaction. And I was in other meetings following in 1989 in convened under the auspices of uh, uh, Madame Mitterrand in France, where we created this interaction. And what we found is at the end of the day, we were all human beings. We all wanted the same thing for our children. We all wanted stability. We wanted a shared prosperity. And what we found is that our shared interests were bigger than our divergent interests. And I, the thing that I have learned in much of my life of what defines leadership, it's about building trust. And being able to bridge those differences of race, of religion, of language, of culture, of gender, of political, of class, constructing bridges that create a shared vision in the pathways of hope we need to present to our people and to the next generation. And into that national gallery in which stands in a central position our founding father, Nelson Mandela, I would place Jane. Fanzel Slavit. And I think that's what we owe that honor that we are giving him tonight to. Because he once wrote that his greatest fear was not that there will not be eventual consensus on the principles of a democratic constitution for South Africa. Far more disturbing are the expectations of, that people have of democracy and its ability to deliver. And that would be the real test of our democracy in the future. On the first point, I absolutely agree. There's a moment of reckoning in Kodessa where the major protagonist, Frederick de Klerk leading the National Party and Mandela leading the African National Congress, reached up across a gulf of mistrust and agreed that South Africa will be served best by a constitutional democracy, which spelt out a Bill of Rights, and as I said earlier, an express commitment to justice and human dignity. It meant we could go forward on the basis of one person, one vote in a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa. And that is the pledge that pulled us back from the precipice of a racial civil war. And that's what Mandela echoed in his inaugural address when he said, we enter into a covenant that we shall build a society in which all South Africans, black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts, assured of their inalienable rights to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. That was our commitment in 1994, a commitment to deliver a better life to our people. 20 years later, a milestone a journey from the darkness of authoritarianism to the light of democratic governance. We should be celebrating. We should be dancing in the streets. We should be thanking our lucky stars that we are not Syria. We are not the Ukraine. We are not Sri Lanka. We are not Nigeria, where there are conflicts that take people's lives in their thousands. But yet, across South Africa, no one seems to be in the mood for a party. And before we understand what might be, we need to ask a fundamental question. Are our lives better 20 years into democracy? And the answer is a decisive yes. We have made progress in extending the right to human dignity that no one can take away my human dignity anymore. I can stand on this platform and assert that human dignity. That's important, but more than that, millions of people today have water and electricity in houses. It may not be important to us in this room because we've always had that, but for someone who's lived their entire lifetime without that, having a light 
to study and talk to each other at night, to cook the food, to heat the water, is about human dignity. It's about economic and political citizenship. And that is something that is a positive. And so we then have to ask another question, a more vital question. Could we have achieved more in these two busy, bustling decades of democracy? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. Our poorest communities today burn and seethe in much the same way that they did during apartheid. There's a divide between the haves and the have-nots that widens by the minute. Our leaders are inaccessible and out of touch. We have not united in purpose or in outlook, and we are a nation against the ropes. This has happened on our watch. Van Zyl Slabbert may have had a crystal ball, but I think the majority of South Africans today believe that we could have been further down the road of tackling poverty, inequality, and joblessness if the specter of corruption had not reared its head so sharply. I listened to the Minister of Finance, Praveen Gordon, in his budget speech earlier this year, proud of the fact that in the past 20 years, tax revenue has increased tenfold, that it will exceed one trillion rand next year, that economically active citizens have tripled to 15 million, and over 2 million businesses are now on the tax register at SARS. I feel proud of that as a South African. In everyone's books, that's a good story to tell. And the Treasury requires to be congratulated. But our more important question is how is that money spent? The overwhelming view is that delivery is poor, marred by corruption, and systems fail because of incompetence and mediocrity. Frankly, we are sliding down a route towards crony capitalism. And in this, I point a finger not just at government, I point a finger at the business community that is involved in dragging our country down into corruption. What we have to do is deal with a huge trust deficit that government has with citizens. And this is what sparks the fury that I see, the anger that is driving almost 13,000 service delivery protests in our country every year. Now, many of them are violent. And why are they violent? You are insulated, many of us, from that violence. But I've been in townships where I walk in the sewage, the raw sewage, where children sit in schools that are barely habitable, where clinics have no medicines to serve those that are HIV positive. And I know the anger that is there. I know the schools that fail and that kids come up of 12 years of education with few skills, no jobs, and unlikely to have the dignity of labor and lifetime. Will you be angry? I would certainly be angry. In 1976, I was angry. So I understand that. And what we have today in a situation where leadership is inaccessible and not on the ground, as it was in the 80s, is people feel that violence is the only way to get leaders to listen. So violence has become a language. So what should we do? We can start by demanding performance. If we stand up on our millions and demand it, it'll have to happen. We should demand that tenders in this country are all published on the internet. We want to know which company gets what projects, what they promise to do and by when. We should have a big signboard, like we started to do in the RDP, where we say, this is the information available to you. This is the budget of your school. If the budget says there should be 20 teachers and there are only 15, that means someone is stealing money. And we need to follow the money. That is the fuel that makes a, a nation succeed or not. We should demand that ministers' entertainment and traveling expenses are public that politicians and state officials have their kids in public schools and go to public hospitals. Half our problem of the collapse of the public sector will be solved. So 
I think that issue of governance is critical. We have to do a whole lot more about how we restructure this economy that some people talk about at length, and many of the proposals that I agree. But the idea that we could continue in such a flagrant way to disenfranchise economically the majority of people in South Africa is unsustainable. And the sooner we come to terms with that, the better. Because sooner or later, the poverty of the majority, their joblessness, will become our problem, all of us. And I think that's our challenge we face. And if I go back to the issue of governance, in 2004, Fonseil Slabert was elected was appointed by cabinet to lead an electoral task team to draft legislation for an electoral system. The report highlighted one important fact, that a view that collective responsibility at five-year intervals is insufficient to ensure political accountability. And I think today that report needs to be dusted and brought back into the public debate because it recommended abandoning the professional list system and adopting a mixed hybrid system between constituency and proportional representation. I think the view that many of us have in this country is that parliament has lost its credibility, that much of the public discourse focuses on the lack of accountability of MPs to voters, brought about by an absence of a constituency-based electoral system, and the top-down effect of a party-less system. In fact, the parliament appointed an independent panel on the assessment of parliament, which presented its report in 2009. And the report indicated a connection between the corruption in the award of state contracts and the lack of accountability of MPs to voters. It was argued that the South African current electoral system encourages members of parliament to be accountable to their party rather than their electorate. And this is a damning indictment on our parliament, the sovereign institution of our democracy. I would go further. In 2012, a report of the Global Commission on Elections, Democracy and Security reported some red flags on electoral finances. Political finance, it said, has not received the attention and commitment to reform that it deserves. In a world of increasing economic inequalities, greater concentrations on wealth, in a global economic recessionary environment, political finance is a challenge that will only grow in salience. As a former president of Botswana, Festus Mokai, a member of the commission added, vote buying and bribery of candidates by el elites is the obvious problem, but poorly regulated political finance can corrode electoral integrity in more subtle ways. Curbing these processes and practices is difficult, since politicians who benefit from loosely regulated financing are unlikely to push for greater transparency. We should not move towards the American system of financing. We should restrict more severely, enforce more severely spending limits so that the well-to-do do not buy our elections. An observation I keenly agree with. States should also seek to level the playing field between electoral contestants by providing public financial support. What he argued is that we should supplement those private donation restrictions with public financing, which admittedly is bound to be limited, but because there are so many competing developments in, a, in any poor country, but there could be non-monetary contributions, like access to free media, airtime, use of public facilities, etc. My thesis is that the electoral system in South Africa needs fundamental reform to ensure greater levels of accountability to voters and to take power away from party bosses that draw up party lists that go to our parliaments. That's my humble message. And that's what builds on what Fanzel Slabit left us as a legacy. My appeal is also to young people. You have power that you do not realize. 
As much as I did not realize, when I was 15 years, I went to go and listen to Steve Biko in a crowded church hall on a summer day in Durban, in the late 60s, by the way. And the one thing that he said that changed my life is that we have nothing to lose but our chains. And you could choose to be a bystander, or you could choose to join a struggle for justice and human dignity. You may die in the process of achieving that, but it would be an honorable death. What it did for me is it took my anger and it gave me a political cause. And I suppose that is true today as it was then. Because our democracy is as old as many of the students that are in this university. And as students, you are ready to for a brave new start on your journey of life. And there's some tough choices that face you going forward. And there are tough choices that face our beautiful country. But these choices converge because we face a moral moment of truth and fairness in our history again today. The world we live in is more complex. It's not black and white like in my generation. There are lots of areas of gray. It's not like political power is everything. Because we live in a world where there are powerful state actors, non-state actors, prisoners, civil society, social movements. We are the most connected generation in history of humankind. Citizens have power today. But we also live in a society where, because of my interaction with many of the climate scientists and some of the greatest minds in the world, where I believe we are running out of time because we live in a matrix web of silence. And you, as the next generation, faces the perfect storm, the intersection between the financial, the economic, the fuel, the, the food, the, the climate, and the jobs crisis. And while I reflect on the architecture of European democracy, arguably, I will be able to say that there are millions of young people today who are educated and jobless in Europe and are losing confidence in that democratic process as much as the unskilled young population in our townships is losing confidence in the democratic process. And that's the reality that people believe that the democrat democracy that we've created is as only as good as what it delivers to the people. And so I read an article this morning on Nigeria. We've been displaced as the biggest economy in Africa. And the political apparatchiks are up in arms. We are confused. But what's the sense of being the biggest economy in Africa when 12 million people go to bed hungry today because they don't have food? It makes no sense to say we have macroeconomic stability when you have to go not far from here into the townships and ask them what is important. And it's certainly not inflation targeting. It's not about the deficit. And what we are saying today is that we need to look at our success and measure it in terms of the pathways we create for young people to leave behind the poverty and marginalization they face today. And in that score, we have failed hopelessly to give hope to that next generation. But also what the science tells us is that if we don't leave 80% of the fossil fuels in the ground, we're all wasting our time. The, cut, the temperature of the world is all indications are we heading above two degrees centigrade. And now we still want to go and you know, mine the Karoo for shale gas. We're going back to old technologies to meet the needs of our new human greed. And so who faces the brunt of that. Now, I've been in places like Turkana where the lake is drying up, the fish are dying, where the, 
the crops have gone and the grasslands have gone and the wars are starting over water where people can't plant food anymore and is driving the migration to the cities where the majority of people are still living in slums. So, the social costs of this. And so, the anger is rising in the world. We've seen it in North Africa, we see it in India today, the outcry against corruption. And, but at the same time, people are not stopping to change their lives. I was in Kibera, one of the largest slums in Africa last year, last, last week. And I saw amazing innovation taking place of people building their own lives, not waiting for government or for some donor, but amazingly improving their lives. So how do we start to look at poor people, not as victims, but as people who have skills, who have social capital, who want the lives of their children to be better than their lives? If you ask me where I started organizing workers, it wasn't in the townships. It was in migrant workers in the hostels, living in brutal conditions, who were the most vulnerable, who were the most illiterate, because they had nothing to lose but their chains. And they are no longer in the leadership of Kosato. So, we are saying that Amazingly, that our technological progress has gone forward. We have spirited ahead. What's happened to our human values? We've gone backward. Because today, narrow corporate interests, driven by financial engineers and actuaries, no longer by in people who, who actually understood production, with a whole emphasis on short-term profitability, and it's no different in government, now dictate the narrative and agenda of our world. But in what we have in our universities, I see the hope that our future can be brighter, that we can rebuild the universities as the nurseries of democratic public debate. So my appeal to particularly the students, particularly the next generation, is that we recognize that we have an inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights as members of a human family based on the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And what the next generation needs to do is translate those political freedoms enshrined in our constitution into the meaningful fabric of hope and opportunity for the next generation. What I know is that a society will fail if we stop to care. It fails when those in power seek to enrich themselves at the expense of the public. It fails when the people lose trust in their leaders. It fails when leaders are so disconnected from their grassroots base that people feel dis disempowered in the democratic process. It fails when cadre de deployment replaces competent civil servants who owe their loyalty not to the party, but to the Constitution. And that's where we need to make a choice. As Madiba has often reminded us, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is the difference we have made in the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. He was a symbol of our brightest hope. His words remind us constantly that overcoming poverty is not an act of charity. It is an act of justice, and like slavery, and like apartheid, it is unnatural and mad-made. It can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. We're not looking for a new messiah. In fact, in a time when we desperately search for heroes and heroines, perhaps we've been searching in the wrong place. Instead of focusing, looking up, the time is to refocus and look down. Because we will find legions of potential Mandelas who are working selflessly in the world that may otherwise have stopped to care. So, for the next generation, your road is difficult. As you pursue academic success, I know that you will succeed. But true success only comes when your success lifts up the society. 
Then the light of success shines with a deep spiritual clarity from within. You are not leaders of tomorrow. You are leaders of today. And I believe in you and respect that you have to contribute towards building a better life for our people. I trust that you will do the right thing, and I wish you well on your journey of life. Finally, I want to thank you, Jane, Marcia, the children, Tanya and Rico, for sharing Fanzale with us. Because we owe him a depth of gratitude that we don't often express. And we don't often give medals, but medals are not important. Because in the minds of people, he was a person that made a difference. And forever, his spirit will live in the constitution of our country. And that is my greatest hope, that we will come back to understanding that our only loyalty is our constitution, which guarantees the human dignity and justice for all our people in South Africa. Thank you very much.